Hi everyone. Um, thanks very much to everyone else that has um, already spoken. For, um, for those of you that don't know us um, yet, uh, we are a relatively new organisation set up uh, post Ebola 2014-15 outbreak. And we were founded at the World Economic Forum in Davos because some of the founding, founding members of CEPI really saw that there was a political moment in time where uh, the world was focused on the outbreak of Ebola, but there was a moment to really think about funding a new organization and, and building a new business model for um, the development of vaccines. So you can see why um, trust in vaccinations is very core to what, um, to what CEPI does. Um, we are essentially set up to bridge the gap between the public and private sectors. There, basically, there's a market failure between, um, in terms of developing vaccines because there's often no market at the end of a very complex and difficult development process. So that's CEPI. Um, I perhaps would like to give a little bit of um, background on where I come from because I'm not from the public health world. I've actually spent most of my career in communications in government. Um, I've worked in Downing Street. I ran the government's um, communications response during the foot and mouth crisis of 2007. So I've been in the kind of firing line of when these um, crises happen and there are just some reflections which I think are very, very pertinent to, to what's happening with um, the issues around vaccine development at the moment. So, I mean, what I would say is there is some very bad news here. Um, this is very difficult and this is a very complex subject matter. And I don't think there's ever been a moment in my professional career where I've seen such a convergence of difficult factors in terms of all of us that are trying to propagate truth over um, misinformation and disinformation. And I think there are a number of reasons for, for that. Um, we've got an increasingly fragmented media. So in the days when I was working in Downing Street, we had 12 core lobby correspondents that we would ring around every day when there was a story, um, story out. That moment has gone. Those lobby correspondents still exist, but you have one moment to shape a story in this fragmented media landscape. And that's basically the moment that it gets published. That's a huge challenge for anybody. Um, we've got an increasingly globalized media. So what happens in one part of the world spreads very, very quickly to another part of the world. So something goes wrong somewhere or there is misinformation, it gets picked up in the, in the uh, blink of an eye. Trust in fact has been hugely undermined and it's something which all the other presenters have, um, have touched upon. And in many places, experts are attacked as elites. So that kind of convergence of external factors makes this an incredibly challenging environment to convey truth and uh, information. So I think we are facing at the moment something which I would call a reputation deficit. Um, trusting politics and government has been, has been undermined for good reasons or for wrong reasons. I think trust more importantly, perhaps, in the mainstream media is also increasingly uh, become undermined. When you think of the war which is really going on in the US at the moment between a presidency and the mainstream media, namely the New York Times, that's unprecedented in my professional lifetime, that you have the mainstream media who are often seen as the biggest challenge to us trying to convey truth and fact. The fact that they are now in dispute with the government is something I think um, uh, unprecedented, in, certainly in my lifetime. Um, the means of misinformation is now more available to anybody than it has ever been before. And I think to those of us who are in the business of conveying truth or fact, we have to radically redefine how we think about this. We're no longer just passive consumers of media. The world out there is no longer just passive consumers of media. We're actually all producers. So that, that definition of those in the know telling those who are uneducated has completely been radically redefined. And we've just got to learn to adapt to that. And then I think we've got a broader geop geopolitical context, which we're all facing. Um, we see the rise of populism. We certainly see its influence in, in the Brexit debate in the UK. We see it in the election of President Trump in the US. And I think really interestingly, in terms of this um, 
this talk today. We've seen it with um, the Interior Minister, I don't know if anyone else has seen it in Italy, um, basically um, today uh, announcing that they want to rescind the vaccination programme. So all of these, I think, are, are products of that kind of convergence of real challenges that we're facing. So just to maybe give you some, just some insight from my my own personal experience, if I can move the slide. I can't do it. Um, as I said, I, just, um, I worked on the foot and mouth disease uh, outbreak in 2007, and there were a number of, I think, really key lessons that, that we learned, which I think are very pertinent to, um, to the debate today and for, and for everybody in the science and public health community. This was the 2007 outbreak, which followed, probably many of you don't remember, but the 2001, which saw burning pyres of, um, of cows. We saw the English countryside shut down, and there was generally kind of mass panic and media fury. Um, when I was working in DEFRA in 2007, we did a number of things very differently the second time round, and I think um, there are some principles here for all of our, all of our communicating. Um, we chose actually to put the experts first in terms of all of the communications that we did around it. And that was important for two reasons. One, you have the people who really know and you remove the politics from, from the issue. Um, and that actually worked incredibly well when it was played out to media who were also specialists in, in their field. And that was a very difficult political decision to make at the time because politicians are, are ultimately responsible for these issues and therefore feel that they should be the ones fronting up quite a lot of the press conferences and the communications. But actually building trust in the experts really, really made a difference. We, um, we became and very, very disciplined, and I think this is really important to the whole vaccine debate, we became very disciplined about being the trusted source of information about what was happening in foot and mouth disease. So what, you actually, what actually happens when you're in the middle of a media crisis like this is the phones are ringing off the hook, the email inboxes are going mad, and you have millions or thousands of inquiries from the global media asking you for updates on um, what's happening with the disease. If you attempt to try and answer every single one of those inquiries as they happen, two things, two things occur. First, you take your core group of people who are actually dealing with the disease off dealing with the disease because they're trying to chase information which, um, which journalists have asked about. Two, your information becomes very, very quickly out of date. So what you have is you, you may give the information which is correct at the time, but by the point at which the news gets broadcast, somebody has found that actually the information you gave was wrong. So in the foot and mouth disease example, um, we were constantly being asked by journalists, do these cows in a particular field in in one part of the country, do they have foot and mouth disease? So we started off by asking the scientific teams, did they, what was the latest information? And very quickly that becomes out of date. So one principle that we really um, engendered was we did two briefings per day and we did no more and we didn't update as the situation evolved. And the first 48 hours of doing that is tough in a very antagonistic media, but actually what, what happens is you give a sense of confidence that you are on top of the brief and that you know, you know your issues. And you don't take your core people off doing what they should be doing, which is dealing with the disease outbreak and um, focusing on that. And I think the principle of that is very, very important in terms of uh, ensuring that you've got kind of fact-based communications which, is, which are landing well. So I think in, in summary, I would say this is a really difficult time for everyone working in this field, and I wouldn't underestimate the challenge that we, that we all face. There is a, there is a rise of um, anti-experts. I think there is a, there is a kind of a, a kickback against perceived elites. Um, I don't feel, though, that, it, it, that the cause is completely lost, and I think in many ways we've, we've, always, faced these, we've always faced these challenges. So just to kind of... End, and I think this is quite interesting given we're perhaps not fighting a, a brand new fight, is um, Socrates said, 
Regard your good name as the richest jewel you can possibly possess of, for credit is like fire. When once you have kindled it, you may easily preserve it. But if you once extinguish it, you will find it an arduous task to rekindle it again. The way to a good reputation is to endeavour to be what you desire to appear. And I think that's the message really to the, to the science community and people working in this, is that facts do matter, integrity does matter, and ultimately it's the only way to convey the truth. Thank you.